right, it is 2.03, so I will begin. And uh, I think people are still joining us. For those of you who like to screech in at the last minute, it's perfect because we're running a couple of minutes behind. So uh, my name is Jana Hexter, and I'm um, welcoming you on behalf of the Northeast IPM Center. Um, we have a full house today. And, um, and so uh, we're going to have to kind of manage the questions uh, in a way that that works, hopefully for, for everyone. So um, I'm delighted that we have um, Professor Tony Di Tommaso presenting on his new book and a presentation called What's That Weed? Before we begin, I am going to, um, I am going to um, uh, go through a couple of slides and um, there we go. So live transcription is enabled. You should be able to choose that as an option if you need to on the on the control bar on your Zoom. Uh, you should be able to uh, check that as an option. We are recording this and within probably about a week, you'll get an email from me uh, with a link to the recording and it will also be up on our website. If you lose the email, don't get the email, just go to our website and you'll see it with all our other IBM Toolbox um, webinars and the link for it is right there. Um, we love questions. We expect a lot of questions uh, today. Uh, we have 150 people online right now. And um, so we need to manage the questions in a particular way. Otherwise, it will become mayhem for us. So instead of using the chat feature, please use the Q&A feature. So if you're not familiar with that, if you uh, scroll the mouse over your screen and go up or down, you should see a black line that comes up with you know, your option to mute and that kind of thing. And one of those is a box, a rectangle, and I believe it says Q&A on it, or it might just be a rectangle. If you click on that, you can type in your question. Um, you can put it in anonymously if you choose, or if you leave your name, then we'll have a record of that, um, of you know who, questions, if there's any uh, possible follow-up at the end. Um, and also, uh, we'd love your questions about identification and classification of, uh, of weeds. Um, I'm sure all of us have lots of questions about how to manage those pesky weeds, um, but we'll, uh, we'll be focusing on identification um, primarily. Uh, so the next slide. Oh, it's my chance to um, welcome uh, Professor Tony Di Tommaso. He is the Professor of Weed Science and chair, uh, Head of the Soil and Crop Sciences section in the School of Integrative Plant Science at Cornell University. His primary areas of scholarship focus on the biology, ecology, and management of important agricultural weeds and introduced invasive plants of natural and semi-natural areas in the Northeastern US and Southern Canada. Uh, uh, Professor Tommaso, Di Tommaso has published over 145 articles and 12 book chapters, and most recently he is the co-author of the book that he'll be talking about today, Weeds of the Northeast, and, it's, um, and um, another book, Manage Weeds on Your Farm, A Guide to Ecological Strategies. He's served as the editor-in-chief of the scientific journal Invasive Plant Science and Management since 2015. So welcome. Thank you for agreeing to do this for us. We appreciate it. So well, well, thank you. That's um, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a uh, it's a pleasure that to be invited by the Northeast IPM program. And um, hopefully, yeah, we'll be talking about weeds and how to identify them. And I'll try to throw in a couple of management uh, um, ways that uh, we can we can control some of these species. So great. Lovely. So, uh, so just before we begin, you should see a poll shop, um, pop up on your screen and uh, it has three questions. Um, it is not a test. It is simply we want to know who is here and how knowledgeable people are. Um, if you don't see it, I know there are some devices um, that people have problems seeing the polls on Zoom or have in the past. Um, so, or if you're driving, please ignore it. Uh, if you're using any machinery, please ignore it. Um, but if you're able to, I'm just going to be quiet for um, about a minute, minute and a half, so that you can respond and that we can have a sense of who is on the call and your level of, um, of knowledge about the topic. So, all right. So we've got 85%. So I'm just going to end that and share the results. So, um, 
Hopefully you can also see that on your screen. So most people fall into somewhat or moderately knowledgeable. Um, and we have a couple of few experts in on the call too about the weeds of the Northeast. How knowledgeable are you about how to identify weeds of the Northeast that also falls into somewhat moderately knowledgeable? And, um, and how knowledgeable are you about how to use Weeds of the Northeast, the book that we're going to be talking about as a tool for IPM? And um, again, that actually it's a little different, not at all knowledgeable or somewhat of a, a two largest. So hopefully that will shift a little during the presentation. So um, we have uh, the beginning of the presentation. I don't know, Tony, if you'd prefer to share your screen or you'd like to, um, or you would like to, um, uh, for me to move your slides forward at the moment. Yeah, if, if you could do that, because I'll speak about each of these, and that would just make it easier for me to, to focus Great. in. You don't mind? No, nope. terrific. And just as a as a reminder for the questions, we would love your questions about identification and classification. And of course, we all have questions about how to get rid of them. <laughs> but where today's focus is, uh, hopefully, as much as possible on those on those questions of ID. So, all right, just tell me when to keep moving forward, Tony, and I'll move the slides. Great. Um, well, thank you again. It's it's a pleasure to um, talk a little bit about this this book that's uh, been five years in the making, and I'll uh, give you a bit of background on it as well. Um, uh, but first, I'd like to thank, obviously, uh, my co-authors, Joe Neal at the North Carolina State University. Uh, Rich Uva was a Cornell graduate um, in horticulture who now has his own farm out in Maryland. Joe DiTomaso, again, not to be confused with myself, which often happens. Uh, Joe is now retired. He was at Cornell. Uh, for a number of years and then um, moved to California. UC Davis is now retired and and uh, myself. And uh, I just want to obviously acknowledge uh, all of them. They were the original three and I joined in uh, for this the second edition. So um, if we can move to the next slide, please. So again, um, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, previous guide, uh, which, you know, I'll say that it, it, it certainly was uh, widely used across the, the country and into actually into Canada. Um, this is, you know, we really kind of built off that, that original uh, version uh, where we now have moved up to close to 540 species uh, that are both ecologically, economically important. And we'll talk about a few of those, um, give you some examples. Um, we will be looking at uh, the the way the book is, is broken up with the uh, identification of vegetative parts, but um, we'll also show kind of the life cycle of the species. We've gone beyond the Northeast in the sense that we now have included species that are actually uh, fairly common and important in the mid-Atlantic states and the upper Midwest, and, and which includes, of course, some Southern Canada. So um, we have expanded the geographic range um, and uh, I think that this this has been uh, tremendously helpful as well. And again, um, we, we talk about the biology and the ecology of these species with the hope that that will inform management. And that's why kind of um, the that, that second book that was mentioned, uh, Managing Weeds on Your Farm, is really kind of particular ecological methods to, to manage the, those weeds. And I can say a little bit about that, that book um, later on. But um, this kind of gives you an idea um, of, of kind of how we were thinking about the book and what's how, what, uh, what is contained in it. And now kind of, if we could go to the next slide, I will talk a little bit about, you know, why did we decide to have a second edition? I mean, it's, uh, it was close to almost 25 years since the original book that you see on your left there, Weeds of the Northeast. Um, and, and part of it is that, um, as many of you know, many species have expanded their range. Um, species, weed species that were particularly common in the mid-Atlantic states are now here. Um, and uh, in part due to climate change, but also just movement by people. Um, the ornamental industry, uh, contaminated seed. Um, and so uh, some examples are, you know, things like water hemp are here, Japanese still garlic mustard are all species that were not contained in that first edition, but are now pretty common in the Northeast and certainly the mid-Atlantic states. Um, and um, 
taxonomists are always changing names um, and scientific names. So we wanted to be, after 25 years, make sure that we had the most up-to-date taxonomic or nomenclature of these species so that nobody would be confused. So that kind of was the, the main motivating factor uh, as to why we wanted to do this. And then we added an additional 200 species um, once we took into account all these criteria. So uh, next slide, please. So here are the original authors. I had to dig up, look at those, those photos and take a look at what happens to life and to people 25 year, years later. Can, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, oh, I just, I just, it just, it jumped, but there was actually, uh, there they are. There they are. I was just a toddler. I would say back then, um, not true, but I thought it'd be. Um, these are, uh, again, the, the, the folks that really should be thanked, that original idea that they had, and, and I joined in for this last version, in a sense, being the only person left in the Northeast out of the group. Uh, obviously, Rich Uva is in Maryland, but um, it was an honor to, to join this group and, and uh, bring the, you know, the Northeastern perspective to it. So, um, again, a thank you to, to uh, my co-authors on, on a, a job well done. Next, please. So how does the book work? Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the original version, we tried not to move too far away from it because it had been one of the most successful uh, books, uh, at least for Cornell University Press, in terms of number of copies sold. I believe over 100,000 copies of that original version had been sold. Um, and so we wanted to keep certainly um, items or, or uh, the contents that uh, were uh, certainly uh, readers really liked. Um, we did, uh, we maintained a dichotomous key um, to narrow down choices for those who are familiar with keys and wanted to go through. Um, not everybody is familiar, but we kept that in. Certainly, uh, there's going to be some terminology, botanical terminology that, that not everyone is familiar with. So we we provided an illustrated glossary so that uh, when we do mention some specific terms, um, descriptions that um, somebody who is not as familiar uh, could understand what we were getting at. And again, the goal, too, was to try to keep jargon to a minimum, make it really accessible to the general public, not just to the scientific community. Um, we included species descriptions, which of course is at the heart of this book. Um, what are they? What am I looking at? How do I know it's the species versus this other species? We did include drawings and obviously photographs um, and, and that takes into account the whole life cycle. So we go from seed to mature plant, well illustrated. And for those species that are fairly similar, there are a lot of similar species within a group or a family, we included comparison tables. And I'll show you later on in the presentation, give you a couple of examples. Again, for those of you who are familiar with the first edition, this will not come to you as a shock. Uh, but for those of you who are, you know, first time looking at this, this guide, um, I have always found those and my students at Cornell always have found those very, very helpful, those comparison tables. Uh, next, please. So, the four main groups of weeds, this is kind of my uh, basic uh, weed science 101. If you were to be here right this fall on campus taking my course, um, we have what are called spore producing uh, species. Um, you know, you're looking at something like horsetail, that would be in that group right there. Uh, we have obviously the grasses, probably the most difficult group to identify. If I uh, base it on uh, students in, in my course, it's it's not easy. Most people will say a grass is a grass, but it's not necessarily. Uh, there are some ways we can tell them apart. Obviously, herbaceous or broadleaf weeds. And we also have woody. We've expanded the, the section on woody plants just because they're, they're, they've become so dominant in some, in some parts of the Northeast that we felt it was important to include them in. Um, and so these are some of the main groups that we'll be looking at. If we can move to the next slide, please. And so um, we do have, here's an example of that uh, vegetative key that identifies uh, based on traits. For those of you who are familiar or understand the terminology, um, all of the words that are typically bolded, uh, you can look at the glossary if you're not familiar with the word monocot, for example. 
you could look in the glossary and it would give you a, a definition of it. You know, these are the grasses, basically. Um, so this is a nice way if um, if you're familiar with the with identification keys. So um, and again, it's based on vegetative traits, not on flowers. Um, and I'll just mention this, that uh, actually in, in managing weeds, one of the key ways that you or most effective ways is to see if you can identify weeds at an early stage, because that'll give you a lot more flexibility in terms of the management. Um, thing, you know, smaller plants or you know, weeds are much easier to control if that is the goal than a mature plant or waiting till it's in flower. Then, you know, by then it might already have competed a crop or in your perennial garden done damage. Um, so having this vegetative key is very, very, very useful. Um, next, please. So um, for grass ID, a key, some key um, terminology is included and, and um, you know, I'm not going to be going through all of this now, but they're basically, um, you know, when you when one looks at a plant, you're looking at a structure called the ligule, um, which is uh, which is basically a structure when present. Um, that's right, um, right below the leaf blade where the leaf blade meets the stem. There's usually a, a structure there that's called the ligule. It can either be a membranous or it can be hairy. Uh, or in the case of something like um, barnyard grass, it's actually absent. It's not, it's not even present. But in any case, there are all these features here, oracles and so forth, that can help someone identify what type of grass they might be looking at or what type of monocot they might be looking at. So um, these are all in, and one other characteristic that I one can use is, for example, if you take the stem of a, of a plant and you roll, if it rolls in your fingers, um, that's already an important characteristic versus where it feels flat, almost like somebody just placed a book on the on the leaves or on the stem and basically squashed it. And that is one way you can tell uh, separate certain plants. Uh, best examples here would be things like orchard grass, if you're familiar with it, um, versus uh, you know Kentucky bluegrass um, that would typically roll in your in your in your hand. So again, the point being here that we provide some nice um, uh, nice features, key features that one can learn uh, to separate out the grasses. Next, please. Obviously, leaf traits. Um, how are the leaves arranged? I mean, this is kind of you know basic botany. Are they in a whirl? Are they opposite, alternate? Uh, those are all kind of features that we talk about. Um, you know, the leaf is it a you know, compound leaf? And there you've got uh, drawings that can help you figure out. Okay, my plant has alternate leaves. Okay, so that's already a, a helpful hint. And the uh, at the bottom there we have basically leaf margins. So is the leaf, are there teeth on the leaf? So, you know, the term dentate means having teeth or a little saw. Um, and are they lobed? Are they entire? And where that becomes important, and I'll give you a perfect example, um, folks often confuse um, staghorn sumac, uh, roost typhina, which is a native species, shrub species here, with things like um, tree of heaven. A Atlantis altissimum, right? Tree of heaven, which of course is important in its own uh, right, not only as a weed, but it's also, um, you know, the spotted lanternfly. Uh, is a, it, it, it's a host. They're both native to Japan. Uh, and of course, that's, that's causing, um, both are causing issues. But uh, the point I wanted to make is, for example, the leaves, the leaf um, margin on uh, Tree of Heaven is entire, does not have any teeth. Whereas for our staghorn sumac, it's dentate. And there are other differences, but that's one key one that, you know, if you're not as familiar, you have the two of them, that can at least separate those two out. So again, these features are all important and they're all uh, nicely presented there. So at the top, in terms of the picture, there is bed straw, smooth bed straw, world leaves. We've got a bipinnate, you know, a, a, a fern. That's there, and then we got alternate leaves of uh, garlic mustard. If you're familiar, that's that that bottom picture. Um, next, please. Now, this I would say this is probably one of the key characteristics down the road for management. So, so far, 
hopefully using this book, you'll be able to identify what you're looking at in your garden, in your field crops, you name it. But then the key is, okay, is this species an annual species, i.e., does it produce seed and then dies? The only link from one generation, one year to the next, is are the seeds. Because that's going to be a different story in terms of management relative to something that is, for example, a field bindweed or a quackgrass that's a perennial that reproduces by roots or uh, underground stems, which we call rhizomes. Again, life cycle is important. So many of our carrot family species, for example, a Queen Anne's lace or wild carrot is a biannual or a burdock. In the first year of growth, the first growing season, they form these, these rosettes, okay? Big, large leaves. They go through a winter. Winter, the cold temperatures stimulate uh, flowering. They put out a big uh, flowering stem produce seed and then die in that second growing season. We call those biannual species. So knowing the life cycle is really, really important as a key characteristic for you to determine then how are you gonna best manage you know, these, these plants? And, and we can talk a little more about those. But anyway, I would say this is really key and we provide that information in the book in terms of its life cycle. Is this an annual? Is this a biannual? This is a perennial. If a perennial, does it reproduce largely by seed, like a dandelion, or does it reproduce primarily by these underground rhizomes, like a quackgrass, okay, or, or uh, you know, or, or something like uh, common milkweed, okay? So, key characteristic. Um, next, please. So, we have a little break put in here for questions, and uh, we have... Uh, two two questions and a comment so far. Uh, we also have time um, at the end for questions. So um, I will start with the comment. Um, so one of the images looked like Scotch thistle. I have this growing in my yard and learned it's a favored food of goldfinch. I like having it grow, but I'm not a farmer and can certainly appreciate the need for eradication on farms. So I will just uh, read that. So um and the other two questions um, are both asking about management. So I'm wondering if we want to leave those um, uh, until the end. And uh, so Lynn Gregory has asked, does your book cover how long the seeds of weeds are viable? Uh, great question. Uh, we in, For species where survival in soil is particularly long we do indicate that the seed might survive you know and again when when we talk about seed surviving long periods and so keep in mind that it's a small fraction of the seeds it's not 100 percent. most seeds for example will uh, will will probably uh germinate and emerge within the first uh three to five years uh, if not in the first second year grasses tend not to survive in soil in the seed bank as we call it uh, um, longer than some of our broadleaf weeds generally speaking they're they're not um they don't persist as long uh, but we do have you know small fractions or proportion uh, percentage of seeds like velvet leaf a butyl antiophrasty that can survive uh, in some cases we've documented 35 40 years but again it's a small point five percent of all seeds but if you keep in mind that some of these weeds, like lamb sporters, can produce 200,000 seeds, one plant, one plant, 100,000, 200,000 seeds, then even 1% of that is a substantial amount. So, um, so to answer the question, we don't provide it for all the species, but certainly where it's a dominant feature of the species, we do try to indicate that information because it is helpful. Great. Lovely. Thank you. All right, and I see that uh, some folks are helping each other with some of the questions that are coming through around management, so that's wonderful. Um, um, <laughs> and then another comment, so why is it so easy for weeds to grow anywhere, even in the worst environment where our plants uh, need so much care? So I don't know if that's can I, can, I com can I comment on that? And yes, yes. You know, that's been one of my beefs even with with some of our um you know uh crop scientists and that is why can't we breed some of those features in these wild relatives of our crops remember all of these plants are wild in as many ways wild relatives and 
And I, I do agree. I, I think that they have some features, uh, you know, survival features. How many of you have seen some of these plants growing in cracks of a sidewalk? And can you think of putting one of your tomato plants in there and seeing how well they would do? So um, they're also to be admired and they're an important genetic resource. So, um, uh, you know, to, to the previous question that, hey, my, you know, birds love some of the seeds of these. I, I totally agree. I mean, there are there is value to these plants. And keep in mind, what is a weed, right? It's a plant out of place. It's a very much, you know, anthropogenic human, um, you know, uh, construct in some ways. Um, because obviously, before human beings, um, there were no weeds, they were just plants, right? Um, but obviously, you know, I do understand and work closely enough with farmers and growers and, and gardeners that um, they can be also very troublesome in terms of, of control. So, um, you know, yes, there are weeds, but there's also some benefits to them. And I want to make sure that folks, um, you know, appreciate that diversity as well, and not because I do. So. Lovely. Thank you. All right. Well, we'll move on. And we do have time for more questions at the end. So keep uh, popping your questions in there. So. So we'll go to the next. So so here's here's kind of the general setup for those 520 species. This is how typically uh, uh, we'll have we'll have images, but we're looking at uh, we get we provide the common name or or at least the scientific name that's most widely accepted. If there's synonyms or if there's similar names, for example, uh, something like quackgrass. When I was going through uh, graduate school, undergraduate school, it was known as agropyrin repens. That's a scientific name. It is now referred to as elytrigia repens. In those cases, we provide both names there just to make sure that folks who knew maybe the previous uh, nomenclature um, don't feel is this the wrong, you know, the wrong species. And we do also include, um, you know, common names as and I should just tell folks, try to stay away from common names as much as possible. I know nobody wants to walk around, you know, naming plants by their Latin name. Um, but uh, common names, uh, we have species that are, you know, have 10 different common names. And so, in, sometimes we don't know, you know, that we're actually talking about the same species. So uh, where possible, um, you know, try to at least know a bit about the, the scientific name if, if possible. Um, we talk about general description there. We talk about the life cycle, uh, general habit, the size is a big plant, small plant, all the kind of information that you would, you know, you need to know. Uh, how does it propagate? Is it by seed? Is it by these underground stems or above ground stems that we call stolons? If you think about your stra a strawberry plant or your spider plants, how they form those little plantlets. Well, that, that connecting, that's a stem, and we refer to it as a stolon, and that's how some weeds can actually propagate. If you've got uh, creeping charlie or grind ivy, you will know what I'm talking about, is when you're trying to get it out of your turf and it t t t you're, you're pulling it out in, in segments, that above ground stem is exactly, um, we would provide that information. Uh, seedling, very important to know what it looks like, mature plant, we talk about the roots, Flowers and fruits, obviously, uh, very interesting. We also provide information on post um, uh, senescence characteristics. Does the plant hang around during the winter? In at least in in upstate New York, central New York, many parts of the Northeast, even uh, under a foot of snow, sometimes you see this uh, reddish plant, or looks like a reddish plant sticking out. That's our docks, the fruit fruiting parts of a, a dock or rumex. Um, so in, and in some cases, the, the whole plant material dies back to the ground, but in some cases it sticks right out. Or if you've got burdock, you can actually still see it in the winter time. So we provide any of that useful information that can, that can help, um, habitat. Where does it occur? Is it a turf grass? Is it a roadside? Is it a field crops, vegetable garden kind of, um, you know, habitat where this species occur? Where is it found in the Northeast? Uh, mid-Atlantic, basically geographic spread of it. And um, a, a feature that's really certainly when you're trying to distinguish species, we do have a similar species uh, section where um, just from our own experience, um, folks can easily mix um, or confuse species, lookalikes, 
um, that, uh, and you know, one of the examples I'll give you in early spring, um, I know a lot of folks confuse what we call colds foot uh, with dandelions because they both have these yellow flowers. They come out about the same time very early. The difference is colds foot and you'll see a picture, uh, the flower comes out before the leaves come out. It's just the flowers, you see it along roadsides very often. People say, oh, the dandelions are out. And they go, oh, well, that's not actually dandelion. That's this, this plant called colds foot, Tisalago farfara. And, uh, you know, it's a different, different species altogether. So um, providing some of that guidance and, and differentiate, why is it different from dandelion, why is colds foot, providing that information. I know in the past, um, readers of the of the guide have really enjoyed or you know found that very helpful. So this is kind of the general setup. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So here's kind of what I was referring to in, in terms of having, you know, the complete life cycle. Uh, we include the seeds, um, you know, pictures of the seed, seedlings, as you can see, plant fruiting parts and then that, that the, the lookalikes. And um, we highlight and, and bold important information. So for example, uh, in the case of dandelion, taproot, very important, perennial. It's got these, these leaves. Um, even though it can reproduce from that taproot, and all of you who have tried, and, and I know I have, tried to get it out of my turf grass, you know, pulling it out, if you even leave a quarter of an inch of that taproot in there, it's coming back. It's going to come back the next year. And I could see it because I still see the original hole that I made to try to get it out. But, you know, I wouldn't worry about dandelion trying to get the taproot out. You should really be concerned more with seed production because that's really, if you want to manage this plant, obviously, uh, beekeepers, um, you know, if you want to make uh, dandelion wine, you're, you're fine. Um, but for those who are trying to control it, you really want to control those windblown seeds. Uh, and, and so the effort should, should go in there rather than, you know, spending too much time trying to get, the, if you can get the whole taproot out, then it's going to work. Uh, but if you got 10 acres, um, it's not going to be fun trying to do it in, uh, in all at once. So, um, and again, there's the, inform the kind of information that would be included. Obviously, a tremendously widespread species throughout North America. It's, uh, you know, I think everybody, every child, kid knows, um, you know, what a dandelion looks like. So, um, next, please. And uh, again, I, I wanted to make the point that we don't uh, restrict uh you know the 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 species we covered to agronomic weeds we include also natural area weeds um and you know wetland weeds and here's a perfect example purple loosestrife uh lithrum salicaria um and i'll i'll make this comment it still surprises me that people will stop their vehicle along a ditch get out and dig this plant out thinking this is a great idea to bring it to our backyard and grow this plant because it is a beautiful plant um and uh but it is tremendously aggressive and invasive it will dry out any area and occupy you know very very invasive we're fortunate that there's an insect that uh, was released a number of years back that's done a pretty good job in terms of biological control and so we do see the plant here and there but not in the you know, vastness or monocultures we've seen we've seen in the past. Um, uh, some folks think it's a mint because it's got a square stem, but it's actually in its own family, the Lithraceae family. So it's not in in the mint family per se. Um, just because the you know often people associate square stems with with the mint family, but this is its its own. Um, and again, very very aggressive. Uh, kind of moving on. Yeah, we could definitely go on to the. Um, well, what can you say about this plant? Um, it, this is probably the species I get the most questions, um, particularly uh, yeah, across the board. Um, Japanese knotweed, some people call it wild bamboo, uh, tremendously aggressive plant. Please do not plant this in anywhere near your house, in your garden. It's a beautiful plant. And if any of you are beekeepers, you all know it's tremendously attractive to bees, um, an important, um, you know, uh, species for, for, for nectar 
and and pollen for bees in the month of August, these white flowers, big heart-shaped leaves, but it's got very destructive, un very large underground stems we call rhizomes that will basically grow right through a foundation. Uh, any crack in the foundation and make its way into your house. And uh, just so you you know, in the UK, a law has been passed that basically one cannot sell a home or a piece of land that includes, that has this plant on it without indicating it in the contract. Uh, if, if you mislead the buyer and don't indicate that you, and hopefully you would know that you have this plant, that has to be stated. Uh, and is uh, just to tell you how aggressive and destructive this plant is. It will literally get right through, lift your asphalt up as beautiful uh, as beautiful as it is. And um, one of you know we're definitely seeing um, you know depreciation of uh, of land values where this plant is found. Uh, not it, I don't have hard data to, to show you, but uh, if people know this is on your, your land and it's particularly if it's, you know, vast areas of it, very difficult to control. You guess you could use herbicides, tarping, but it's got to be repeated over a long period of time, especially for extensive uh, type uh, species. One thing you might have noticed about this plant, it's very susceptible to frost. A very light frost will kill it. People, you know, you'll see it on roadsides and you go, what happened? Well, a light frost, but it's got so, those those root reserves and rhizome or below ground reserves are so, you know, uh, well, strong and, and that it's, it's not going to bother it. It's going to come right through. Um, so, uh, you know. They're, 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 they're releasing a biocontrol agent um, that hopefully will do will do the job. But we t I just noticed, you know, a, a bio a fungicide um, regalia that that's also effective. So by no means, you know, uh, you throw your hands up. But it's it's one that if you can, uh, you know, avoid planting or having on your on your land, um, it's it's uh, certainly something that we sh you should all be thinking about. Um, and it's so widespread that it's it's really problematic. So um, I'm sure folks will have other other comments. I, I can tell you that if you try tarping, uh, it's got to, you know, you really have to cover it widely. Um, those underground rhizomes are going to seek light and basically grow below ground, try to f and, and come out almost like guerrilla warfare, show up 20 feet from where you kind of put your tarp in, um, but at least it will it will draw down those below ground reserves. So, uh, but you really would have to keep at it. So, again, a little more on the management because this is such a uh, you know I wouldn't call it even a poster child, but the bad of the bad. Uh, as much as it's a beautiful plant in itself, um, an another uh, species that I um, would like to talk about is this multiflora rose. Um, here's a perfect example of something that was purposely planted in the Northeast as a, a, for field edges to keep animals within a given, a given field. And uh, it got away from us, and it's uh, pretty aggressive. Any of you who have this plant know how um, you know, destructive it can be if you try to you know, penetrate through uh, with those sharp spines. One, one feature that I wanted to mention is that... Uh, uh, how you can actually tell it apart from um, from uh, our cultivated roses is that it has, and if you look at that top left picture, it's got this uh, a feathery stipule at the leaf base. Um, so where where that uh, compound leaf meets the central stem, there's that little stipule, and and on your right on the right hand side, you actually see a, a photo of it, the middle the middle picture. Um, so when you see that, if you're not sure, you know what do you have? Um, you, if you do have that stipule, that'll be a good indicator that this is your multiflora rose. Um, I will say that uh, there is a, a, I believe it's a bacterial disease that is impacting it. Uh, some of you might have seen it around the state or the Northeast. Uh, it's called the rose rosette disease. Turns it kind of a white, um, you know, yellowish uh, color, and it, 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 it can draw the plant back a fair amount. But the uh, um, 
the not so good side of it is that it, this this disease also impacts our cultivated roses. So it's not something you go, well, I'm just going to try to you know, propagate this disease if you've got uh, cultivated roses. So, um, but just wanted to point out another species that we cover um, that uh, again um, is is pretty common around. The obviously deer don't like it too much. Uh, not with those spines, so it's 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 got a stranglehold. I would say the honeysuckles, multiflora rose are probably in the understory, and buckthorn are our biggies in terms of uh, how well they can they can can be. Um, actually, a point was made by Mary. I just uh, that uh, uh, mistake in terms of mentioning that it was the uh, rose rosette was a bacterial. It's actually in, in, indeed a viral disease. So thank you for for that correction. It is a viral disease. Um, and so um, that's one that the people have talked about. Could we, you know, could this be a possible biological control agent? Um, and it's something people have explored. But again, having, you know, uh, these, this virus also impacting our cultivated roses, it doesn't seem like it would be a kind of a natural that you would want to, to do this. So um, on the agronomic side of things, this is a newcomer to um not only to new york state but the northeast palmer amaranth a southern southwestern species uh this is a pigweed that can grow uh to at least um you know can be seven eight feet ten feet uh almost looks like a tree very resistant to multiple herbicides it was something that i was hoping we would never see in in the in the northeast new england uh, but it's here, um, made its way in contaminated equipment from the Midwest. It's now here to stay. It's got both uh, plants occur. There's both a female and a male plant. We call that, that a dioecia species, um, but a very, very aggressive. And uh, now we need to deal with it. Um, and uh, again, um, our herbicide choices are uh, quickly um being reduced just because of how quickly it uh, acquired resistance through the overuse, I would say, of many of our herbicides. So uh, be on the lookout. This is a newcomer, was not in the first book at all. So um, this is what we mean by some of these species that have moved in in 25 years have really moved into the, into the region. So if I could go to the next one, please. So um, we also include these comparison tables, and these I find very helpful. I know um, readers and, and, and folks who have used the, uh, the previous guide uh, always comment on how helpful these, these uh, comparison tables were, and we've included them for a number of families um, and or uh, features. For example, weeds with finely dissected leaves. What could they possibly be? Um, you know, these are very, very useful or, or trifoliate legumes or wood sorrels. How do you tell them apart? Uh, nightshades. Again, a lot of this was also um, uh, stimulated by, by readers of the book saying, if you could include one of these tables, that would be really helpful because it's often very confusing to try to tease out these, these different species. So uh, we've included those in. Please you know, make use of these um, for those of you who are kind of new or trying to figure out what, what kind of uh, species you might have. So um, that's, that's really helpful. Next, please. And, and here's an example of what we mean by a comparison table. Um, here we've got um, trying to separate out the bindweeds and, the, and wild buckwheat. Uh, which are often confused species. The bindweeds are in their own family, um, or at least, you know, the convolvulaceae. Wild buckwheat is actually in the polygonaceae or the smartweed family. Very, very different. Uh, the bindweeds, some of you know, have those funnel shapes. Some people call them the morning glories. Oh, it's a morning glory. And, and here's my other pet peeve. Please do not call the bindweeds morning glories. The morning glories should be reserved for the pomia species, the true annual morning glories that people even have ornamentals um, because the bindweeds are perennial and they're very, very difficult to control. Uh, all of you who have struggled with these vines growing up um, you know, in your, in your gardens, in your uh, perennial gardens or vegetable gardens, uh, these have deep uh, roots, 
uh, can go very deep and are very aggressive. Um, and here I'm referring to both the hedge bindweed and the field bindweed. Um, so they should be referred to as bindweeds and not morning glories, even though they have those flowers. Um, the hedge bindweed, the way you can tell it apart from the field bindweed is that it has these big green bracts as, uh, holding up the, uh, the funnel shaped flower, much larger flowers, whereas the field bindweed, apart from, as you can see, the difference in leaf shape, does not have those bracts. In fact, those bracts have been, are been reduced in size and are further down the stem. The flowering stem. Um, control is about the same. Both the hedge and field bindweed are terrible to control, very difficult to control. Herbicides work or repeated cutting, mulching, if you're kind of an, you know, not using herbicides. And the wild buckwheat is an annual. It's an annual plant. You, you should be focusing on, on uh, you know, trying to control the, um, the seed production, basically. Um, anyway, that's kind of just to show you how important these comparison tables are hopefully they're helpful in terms of the life cycle. Uh, next, please. And here's an example uh, looking at the, uh, you know, some of the trifoliate uh, legumes and, and wood sorrels, which are, you know, obviously in a different family. Any of those that are a lot, you know, can be very confusing, all these clovers, and we've tried to include those in a, in a table and try to help you out to, to differentiate them. Um, one one feature, something that I, I, I'm always surprised at sometimes, uh, red clover, I think most people will see the red flower, call it red clover, no problem. White clover sometimes can have an, oran an orangey reddish tint to it, not always. But one way you can tell the the red and from one way, there are many uh, from the white clovers that the white clovers, the flower is on a, a its own leafless stalk. So in, in white clover, if you actually look and you've got clover, look at it, it'll have just this nice stem with no leaves and the flower being held up. Whereas obviously in the red clover, as you can see in that top picture, right hand side, the flowers has, is on, it has leaves all around it. Okay, obviously um, it's typically the red is also ha hairier than, than the white typically has no, no hairs. But, any of those features we include that hopefully can help you differentiate the species. So that's where those tables come in. So with that, um, I know, you know, you're going fast through this. I could take you through all the 529 species. Um, but I, I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, obviously this is a weed identification guide. I know many of you obviously great, I can identify it. So now what do I do? How do I control it? And I mean, that's totally understandable. That's in part, uh, you know, half of my course here at Cornell is on DID, but then we move into both chemical, non-chemical control. Um, if, if you're able to visit um, my uh, lab website, um, there is a, a, a recent book, well, a couple of years back now that we published with my, uh, a great colleague of mine, the late uh, Chuck Moeller, called Managing Weeds on Your Farm, uh, an Ecological Perspective. Uh, and that is, um, you know, ecological strategy, so non-chemical control. And we cover many of the species that uh, are covered in this book. And there we really focus on the ecology, biology to inform management. And how do we manage this by tillage and, and cover cropping and so forth. So um, I will say that the that book, the PDF is uh, freely available, downloadable, and um, Dana just put up the uh, link to uh, the PDF to, um, to that book. Feel free to download it. It's a big one. If you'd like a hard copy, I believe they're, they're charging $24. It's mostly to ship it to you. Um, and, uh, but I know folks have found it very helpful. If you're, uh, again, it doesn't, we don't cover herbicide uh, management. So for those of you who are, you know, more looking at into herbicide management, that wouldn't necessarily be the, the book for you. Um, but um, certainly, you know, I'd be happy to talk more about, um, you know, herbicide management of some of these, these, uh, you know, crop weeds and so forth. Um, and, uh, but with that, I will um, leave it there. I think I mentioned if any of you have, uh, I mean, we, I can answer some questions, but if um, people want to get in touch with me, I think you saw the information, my email at, at Cornell, it's ad97 at cornell.edu. 
Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. It might take me a while to get back to you, so please don't think that I've just forgotten. It's uh, We're in the middle of the semester, or at least just getting started, so it, it gets fairly busy. But uh, I'd be happy to answer any, any questions that you might have. And if I don't know the answer, I'll connect you with somebody who does. So with that, I think I'll stop here. Um, and, and again, thank you all for taking time out of this, uh, your busy days to listen to talk about weeds. What else? <laughs> As someone who's just spent uh, about an hour last night dealing with Japanese knotweed, <laughs> I know it's actually very helpful. Um, all right. So I'm going to ask this a couple of questions. Um, uh, Catherine Soro has asked, and excuse me if I mangle the, the name, is Amar Amaranthus uh, hypochondriacus also invasive? Uh, I am not as familiar with that species. I have heard of it. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I'd rather not say, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not as familiar with it as I am with some of those other more typical agronomic weeds. And there are six or seven that, that we cover. So if certainly anybody that's, um, you know, listening in that has some information, feel free to, to share it. Um, with the group, uh, I'm always learning. So, um, okay. yeah, I'll leave um, it at that. And I, I'm going to look it up actually once we're done. So um, I've got some work to do as well. But thank you for the question. All right, great. Well, I was going to say we'll have a, a list of the questions that we can go back to. So uh, Sarah Kingsley Richard has asked, uh, does the book cover any aggressive ornamentals that tend to escape home gardens? Uh, like a juga and loose strife. Yeah, we 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 do cover a bunch of those loose strife. We have also burning bush, calorie pear or Bradford pear, which um, I know, you know, when I last presented about this book, um, there was heated discussion about what are we going to do with uh, you know folks are still planting this uh, Bradford type pear and very invasive. So. There are a number of those species, particularly in the shrub section and uh, also in the, the vine section. So take a look at that. I'm, you know, we're not covering, we can't cover everything, but we do cover some of the more noxious species that basically have gotten, uh, gotten away from us. Keep in mind that approximately 50% uh, uh, of, or at least 50, 60% of all of our uh, invasive species, plant species, had some ornamental value or were brought in purposely for as an ornamental and then have gotten away from us. Um, so yeah, it's it's really important to keep that to keep that in mind. Great. Um, and then um, Anshul Rana has said, um, how much contribution uh, do, do weeds give to harbor pathogens? that can harm and infect agriculturally important crops? Really, really important question. It's, um, so there's two sides to this. One side that people talk about, uh, particularly in field margins, there's a, a, an increasing awareness that it'd be nice to increase biodiversity in our ag systems. I mean, in, in upstate New York and many parts of the Northeast, we're fortunate we have very diverse ag. Um, and so there's been this this interest in trying to increase biodiversity by planting uh, floral species that can help pollinators and and uh, uh, help beneficial uh, predators that go after pests. But one of the downside for some of these is that they can also harbor pests and and diseases. And uh, you know one species that that uh, you know comes to mind is. Uh, uh, for example, uh, in uh, buckthorn, which is, you know, a, a, a sub canopy shrub that can grow you know, pretty tall. It also is an alternate host for uh, soybean, you know, uh, cyst or, or soybean diseases, I should say. Um, so when it's next to fields, it can be problematic. Um, and so, um, you know, you need to be aware of any negative impacts of having some of these species as alternate hosts. So very often things like uh, wild oat, some of the grasses are alternate hosts for diseases of some of our uh, cereal crops, uh, small small grain crops. So again, uh, not something that needs to be, you know, 
necessarily we have to dismiss, but we need to be aware of it. And and um, and that's that's important. So and we try to indicate that in the book. If there is a clear relationship, uh, you know, major disease that is hosted by these weeds, we'll mention it. Okay. All right. Um, and then uh, Catherine Soro has asked, alongside purple loose strife, what would you say about long neck loose strife? Um, again, not as familiar with it, um, with the species. Um, my, my sense, I mean, it, 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 as long as this, I mean, you can't get more aggressive than purple loose strife. I mean, Japanese knotweed is kind of, um, so, um, if I haven't had any personal experience with, with the second species, so it's hard for me to, to know how aggressive it would be. Uh, but if it's any anything like purple loose drive, I would, uh, I, I'd be worried. But I know that there have been some species that have been released more on ornamental that are not as aggressive. Um, and, and we have some examples like for gout weed, for example, some of the, uh, the, the varieties that are being sold now in nurseries, this is a ground cover some of you might be familiar with that, that is, it can be very aggressive. Um, they've been bred not to, to, you know, proliferate as much as, which is which is really helpful. So, um, and of course, the nursery industry is doing their best to try to look at alternatives, native species that could replace some of the um, the non-native species that have actually become problematic. Um, so, again, not as familiar with that species, but um, hopefully nowhere near what okay. uh, purple loosestrife is like. Okay. Um, so, Dina Wiseman um, actually put it in the chat, but um, is gout weed covered in the book? Uh, yes, it is. Um, so it's it was not in uh, the original version. We it, it, uh, we received so many questions, at least here in the Northeast, that it, it had to be in. And I'll I'll mention another species that was not in, that I I uh, really um, harped on. My uh, co-authors uh, was uh, wild parsnip, Pastinaca sativa. Or many of you are familiar. You know, it's that that yellow flowering uh, Apiaceae or carrot family humble like plant that you see along roadsides in uh, you know July August and it's such an important one because it can cause photodermatitis when you get the sap on your skin on a sunny day uh, and uh, you know and so we we include it but yes to get back to the gout weed absolutely got that in this year uh, or in this version I'm glad it's in great um and I have um uh, since you mentioned the the big four, the knotweed, buckthorn, purple loose strife, and honeysuckle, um, I'm going to ask one question about how do you get rid of ha uh, wild honeysuckle? Um, since we I kind of didn't really mention that much in this in this presentation. Yeah, well, and and you should know that there are at least three or four different honeysuckle species that that are in easily in our region. We do have a, a section on the honeysuckles that, in, that that we look, we included them. I think I have at least two species at my place here in, in the Ithaca area. Um, and uh, very difficult to, to control. I mean, you can, you know, keep chopping them down. I mean, deer love them, they eat, they spread the seeds. Uh, so do birds. Um, and um, you know, uh, often is, I mean, if you're using, you can, you can use herbicides if, if that's the case, you know, you can cut them and then, you know, um, apply even a herbicide when you're, you know, cutting, basically applying a herbicide right on, on the stem to make sure it doesn't re-sprout. Um, it's a bit like privet. Privet is another of those very invasive uh, ornamentals that people were planting and now got away from us. But, um, the the other is is just repeated repeated cutting with this this species. I've tried at my place. It's at least seven years, then it, they keep coming back. Unless you're able to just pull the whole thing out, and when you've got large area to cover, it's very difficult. Certainly, if people in the audience, if any of you have uh, you know some good ideas of how you have gotten rid of some of these honeysuckles, um, that would that would be great. Again. Uh, for some people, it's it's uh, provides uh, food and shelter for wildlife, but um, they can be they can definitely be invasive in some of our old fields, um, at least field edges that I've seen. Yeah, I have the same issue at my house. Um, so Leonora Jones uh, is in the Pacific Northwest, and she said she also they also have other knotweed species 
Bohemian and, and Giant, for example. Uh, do you also see those in the Northeast and are they as pr problematic as the Japanese knotweed? Oh, that's a great question because they, they're, there's also, there are hybrids of the two, of Bohemian and, and Giant. Um, I believe we do have some hybrids here, not as common. The definitely the Japanese is the by far in the Northeast the most common. There have been some great studies coming out of the Pacific Northwest exactly on those species. Um, and uh, if, if we do have some of them here, they're um, particularly the Bohemian, um, they're, I wouldn't say they're not as common, but often probably misidentified, I would say is there because they can be if one is not as familiar with the two species and there is hybridization going on. Um, but I think they're they're just reading some of the papers, uh, research papers coming out of the Pacific Northwest. It seems like they're just as aggressive as our Japanese knotweed here. And I, I would imagine those hybrids would be likewise. Okay. Um, and then uh, two other questions left. I have some helpers in the background who are providing some links to some questions on control. Um, do you, uh, I, a comment actually from uh, Richard Van Brink Franken, um, who says, while in high school, he worked for a local horse farm in Saratoga County, planting thousands of multiflora roses as a living fence around the fields, didn't keep the horses in, but stuck around for a long time. And those living fences were promoted by USDA and RCS at the time. So it's more of a, a comment, but I didn't know if there was something useful for you uh, to share about that. So. No, that's that's uh, I, I, and I'll share also um, for those of you who are familiar with um, who I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of an, uh, the other species that was, uh, oh, um, that was actually purposely planted and actually was uh, welcomed. Uh, and that is our good friend, if some of you are familiar with kudzu, kudzu, the legume. Um, there is actually somewhere in Florida, a big plaque mentioning that this is the first place where kudzu was planted and brought in um, the, uh, as a forage. And of course, if you've been anywhere in the mid-Atlantic South and you're looking at, you know, just kudzu taking over everything. Um, but that was, a, that was, yeah, that was the comment. I'll, I'll just, I, I've been seeing a couple of those uh, chats. People have had some really good good comments. I know one of the comments about using triclopyr, um, you know, um, a stem application does has done a good job on managing uh, some of our shrubs. Uh, I think uh, don't recall who mentioned the whole privet that the, the the question about privet not being actually very tolerant of shade. That is actually a good point to be made. That um, and I believe the the person had mentioned that they planted uh, maples to shade them out and, and did a good job. So there are definitely ways of doing it. it might take a while. Um, but anyway, thank you. Those are great, great comments that are helpful to, to many, many people. And, and these are from lived experiences. So I, I really enjoy getting those, those comments. And um, I'll be sure to read them all because it's going to inform my own knowledge of how mm -hmm. folks are managing some of these species. Okay. Uh, Jared Frito has said, does the book have an have uh, what native can compete with invasive, such as jewelweed can compete with knotweed? Oh, that's, it would have been, we, unfortunately, we don't have that. That would have been one of my, um, I, I think the book got so large at one point that I think the publisher said, you cannot keep adding stuff because that would have been exactly what I would wanted to do. For example, you know, we have Norway maple, you know, some folks were asking, you know, what else can I find? It's pretty straightforward. Or we have some nice, you know, um, native maples that we could be be planting. But I would have loved to have had that. I know there's, um, we have, uh, at least certainly New York State, there's some nice um, information on what, you know, from the nursery industry and from the uh, Department of Environmental Conservation, what could we replace, say, something like burn, burning bush with? Uh, that's native and so forth, but unfortunately we don't. I wish we did, uh, because that's exactly where I was thinking, but they wouldn't allow allowed us another five pages on this book. It was already too big. Yeah. All right, great. Um, and there's another question too. Can one make biofungicide for a home orchard by grinding up Japanese knotweed? Wow, that's a great, I have not. 
I have to leave that to the audience if there are folks that that know um, if that that works. Now, you know, it, you do have to keep in mind that, you know, a number of these species do produce a little chemicals, right? So, you know, there's some um, some good evidence that uh, a number of our invasive species release chemicals and in fact, in some cases, uh, impact revegetation. Uh, so when we're trying to, you know, okay, let's plant the, you know, we, we get a swallowwort or in Canada, they call it dog strangling vine. Um, when Even when we remove these, these invasive vines and say, well, we want to plant some native species or at least more favorable species, sometimes these replantings fail because of this, this release of a little chemicals. I think, uh, you know, that, that was one of the, uh, at least the original issues with garlic mustard was that, uh, you know, those soils uh, were, you know, the revegetation sometimes failed in these, uh, when these species were removed. So um, I don't have an answer to the question in particular with Japanese knotweed, um, but I, I guess I wouldn't be surprised, at least be worth trying. I'd be interested in trying. And I don't know exactly what, what compounds um, would be in the plant, but if others know, if they want to share that in the chat, that would be fantastic. Okay, great. Um, uh, pa Patricia Fisher has asked, how do we get rid of the re weeds that we pull? In her county, they can't be disposed of in the weekly recycling. Uh, well, I would say if, if the weeds are, are small and they don't have any seed and they're not, um, don't have, um, you know, vegetative structures, rhizomes and stuff, I, when I do the weeding, I, might, I just throw them in my compost. They, they, they can enrich. Now, I wouldn't do that for something like common purslane um, because they can easily reroute. Um, so, portulaca. Um, for really nasty species, depending on how many you have, what I've done in the past is, is I just put them in plastic bags, garbage bags, and put them on cement on, and let them solarize in a hot, sunny day. Just, you know, they that temperature really just kills them, uh, you know, a couple of days of those, you know, hot, sunny days in, in, in the middle of July. But uh, if, if a species doesn't have spines or is poisonous in any way, I would, uh, I would, I just compost them. And I, I don't have, you know, a, a very high end, high tech facility. I just, you know, have a little box and I throw all grasses and stuff and I've never had any issues as long as they're not in seed obviously or have you know tubers or any reproductive structures okay all right um okay and folks are putting some links in for people or um some extension links for people around some questions around control but Absolutely. the one that hasn't been uh addressed um is do you have any information on lesser celandine control Oh, lesser celandine, our favorite. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this plant, um, it's uh, one of those that we call spring ephemerals. It's basically out in very early in the growing season here in, in the Northeast or upstate New York. Um, and uh, basically lasts about three weeks. Um, it invades anything that you can. It, the seeds float in water so it can be easily be carried and uh, you just get a sea of yellow, beautiful looking plant that, again, I'm still amazed that people share, say, would you like to have this plant in your yard? Um, it's, uh, the trick with that plant is that it's um, the short growth period. Um, herbicides do work, that's kind of the main, if you have small populations, you can try to dig it out. It's got these underground tubers, um, that you know, one would have to scoop up. Um, the other, the other way is is again, if you have patches of it, again, uh, trying to smother it, make sure it doesn't get any light uh, would work. Uh, but sometimes it's in these very you know hard to access areas like along a, a creek and so forth, and those are very very difficult to control. Um, there have been herbicides that have worked. Uh, I'll say that we published a review on this species uh, in a journal called Invasive Plant Science and Management. If anybody 
would like to have a copy of that. Uh, I if they can just contact me and say, would you know, if maybe you don't have access to that journal, um, and it provides management uh, information basically, uh, particularly for land managers. So I'd be happy to to send you a copy of that paper, and it's in language that's straightforward uh, and helpful. And again, if if folks out in 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 the audience have other uh, extension bulletins that talk about management, effective management, feel free to share that with the with the others, because that's kind of how I've always, uh, you know, learned from from others as well. But also in this published literature, I'd be happy to if they just contact me and let me know about lesser sound. Deed. But it is becoming increasingly a problem species. Uh, hardly people 10 years ago hardly talked about it. And now it's it's commonplace in April that people talk about this yellow flowering plant that's in their turf and the river, you know, little creek side and in their turf grass. All right. OK, well, um, we, I know we could sit here and ask questions all day. And um, and uh, I, what I'm going to suggest is uh, there's some great resources that have come through in the um, in the Q&A. And I think what we'll do is we'll compile those um, so, and send them out and put them on the web page with the recording. And um, we'll show them to Tony. And if there's one that he wants to add, because um, um, there's lots of questions about, you know, managing um, the, the the top of most, uh, most um, aggressive ones, including this uh, stilt grass. A few people have asked about that and we haven't, I haven't really touched on that. So that's going to be my, my suggestion. And, um, thank and, and Jenna, can I just uh, just a quick word for those of you, obviously that are in the Ithaca area or or um, are hoping to or if you travel down on campus, we do have a um, weed garden here on campus um, that is accessible, open to the public. It includes about 120 species, including poisonous plants that our veterinary students uh, also use um, to study from, basically to be aware of, uh, you know, plants that are poisonous, particularly to livestock. Being vet students, that makes total sense, but it's integrated into our weed garden and um, all of the plants are labeled. They're in, a, in, the, in a, by family, common name and so forth. So I, I wanna encourage anybody that's uh, close to, to campus or uh, one day wants to visit um it's a it's a great spot obviously during the growing season is the best time not not in the middle of winter but uh it's a great resource and it's nice to take the family out and take a look at some of these plants and you'd be surprised by s some of them like i always wondered what this plant was and now you get to see it in in, in real so just wanted to you know mention that additional resource um for those of you who are maybe not too far from the Cornell campus in Ithaca. Great, and I just uh, clicked on the wrong button. Someone asked what your email address is. I believe it's ad97 at cornell.edu, and it's also going to be in the slides. You'll be able to see it um, um, for uh, when when the recording comes through. Um, and where exactly is the weed garden on campus? I just put a link to it um, in the chat. So Regina, if you go and have a look, um, there is a there's a website with a with a link to it and. Um, and uh, that should that should help you find it. I was actually going to try and find it myself. That's kind of cool. Um, so I, with that, I'm just going to, there's a little bit of housekeeping for us uh, for the end. Um, and uh, we have another poll, I believe. Um, there we go. If that can pop up, if you'd be so kind as to uh, click on the poll when it shows up. That's not showing up on my screen. Uh, Yep, there we go. Okay, it should, should show up in, on your screen. It's shown up on mine. Um, similar questions as before. And um, and uh, if you just take a, a minute just to uh, respond to that, that would be really useful for us. Um, we can use it in our reporting. And I'm sure it'd be useful for Tony as well. I would think that everybody would be an expert by the end. But um, <laughs> knowing anything about weeds, um, it's they're always challenging. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, as, as folks are filling this out, I just want to say I always mention to students in my class that there are three certainties in life, death, taxes, and weeds. So keep that in mind. I've never been with a grower or with a gardener or you name it that said, you know what, this year, I don't think I'll be weeding. 
they're just not going to be any weeds. Um, that in some ways is job security for folks like myself, but um, at the same time, I all, also marvel at these plants. I think that that we should also appreciate um, their their will to live and 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 survive despite everything that we try to do for some of them. So, um, uh, you know, they do provide important ecosystem services as well. So I, I don't want to slant it all the way because this the weeds is always kind of a pejorative kind of term. And I want to show, you know, having studied botany and, and, and being interested in plants, I also, you know, kind of, like I said, I marvel at how well they do. Uh, and then, like I said, I wish some of our crops uh, and, and uh, you know, favorable plants that at least we think. Um, but in any case, yeah, thank you. I really appreciated this. This has been fun. Yeah. And um, and Mark Lesher, he said, but you don't have any problems growing a weed garden. <laughs> Maybe you do. <laughs> you know, I'll just say this. It's amazing, even during as we're trying to get some of our weeds ready so students in the class can see them, how difficult sometimes it is to germinate, to get some of these plants. Ragweed is a great example. And and people are looking at me, you're having trouble, you know, growing a weed? Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a crazy twist on things. But, yeah, we we have a weed garden, which is always funny. Uh, to folks, if you can imagine it. <laughs> um, so I'm also, uh, I'm just going to sort of scroll through, but you can see most of the um, results fall now in the moderately vera, uh, and very, uh, so definitely I can see that things have uh, moved along and was, uh, which is very nice for us as a result of this webinar, how likely are you to increase your use of IPM? and very likely or extremely likely. So that's great. That's what we love to hear. And um, and then there's a couple of other things. We have another webinar uh, coming up, uh, probably for a completely different crowd than the people that are here today, um, but maybe not. Uh, working with museums, libraries, and archives to use IPM to prevent and combat, uh, combat infestations. Um, so that is coming up in October. I'm also working on a couple of other um, uh, presentations um, in the coming months that haven't been finalized. So uh, pay attention, stay tuned. Um, there are some things that will be uh, coming out over the winter. Um, we also have um, this option to find a colleague. So um, if there are people uh, who are interested in working, um, if you're looking for colleagues who are interested in weeds in the Northeast, you can post a profile about yourself on our website, and then you can also go to our website and see who has posted a profile. Um, and then uh, you can find each other if you're looking for a collaborator on a, on a project. Um, if this is the, the place to go. And um, I was just looking at it the other day, actually there's quite a few people that have listed themselves um, and since the time that we put it up. So it's a great resource. Um, as I said, there will be a recording available on our website, probably in about a week. We do some editing and, and um, you know, collating of information. And, um, and uh, I will also send you an email. Anyone who is registered will get an email with a link to the recording. Um, and finally, but certainly not least, there are two acknowledgements. One is a land acknowledgement that the Northeastern IPM Center is based at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayakono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gayakono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. This acknowledgement has been uh, reviewed and approved by, by the traditional Gayakono leadership. And also, we want to acknowledge that we are funded by USDA NIFR, um, and uh, this presentation would not happen uh, without their funding. We really appreciate it and uh, want to acknowledge and thank and uh, last but certainly not least is uh, thank you, Tony, for decades, hours, I can't imagine how many thousands, uh, if not hundreds of thousands of hours have gone into this presentation in terms of your studying and your expertise and your mentoring 
and um, thank you for bringing it all into this hour and a half and uh, and sharing your expertise with everybody. So thank you. Great. It's it, it's been a pleasure and and thanks everyone again for taking time out of your busy days to to join in. So glad. Thank you again. Okay. All right. Bye, folks. <laughs>